be looking tonight, particularly in the book of John, chapter number 5. <clears throat> I'm sure it's somewhere through the years we've looked at this, but hopefully I can provide some, you know, uh, renewed insight, um, and uh, hopefully I can provide something new to you uh, that will be fresh for this hour in which we live. How many of you uh, grew up in summers? Uh, we didn't know a lot about swimming pools where I grew up in West Virginia, but we knew a lot about the river and the lake, and I uh, got to go swimming, dive in. Any of you just enjoy swimming in the summer? You know, uh, we, we call them Cricks Creeks. Uh, sometimes that was some of our swimming. That's the way that it just was for us. Just being able to, <clears throat> to dive in, and uh, thank God for those fun days and for those great memories. And uh, <clears throat> But when we come to John chapter number 5, we read about some folks who really wanted to dive in. They wanted to uh, get into the pool, but they couldn't. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. John chapter number 5, I'm going to start reading verse number 1. We'll kind of break it down and look at each verse, kind of like how we do in Bible study. But let me just read down through uh, verse number 9. The Bible says, and, and after this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is, is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folks, of blind, halt, withered, one waiting for the moving of the water. For the angel went down at a certain season in the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then was the first after the troubling of the water stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie <coughs> and knew that he had uh, been uh, now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth, before, steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man, uh, the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. So, this is a story that most of us have heard before. The pool of Bethesda, the troubling of the water. When uh, the, the water was troubled, the first one to get into the water was made whole of whatever their disease was. We look, we read, there's many, many different types of diseases that are represented there. And so, verse number four is interesting. For an angel went down in a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then uh, first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Keep that verse in mind. I'm going to make a quick reference to it. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. You can look and study it out on your own and, and, and come to more conclusions. I'm not going to greatly, greatly, greatly deal with that verse. And so that's why I focused on it. Although it's important, although it's in the Word of God, I believe God's Word has authority. I think God has complete control over His Word. And so as you look at that, keep that in mind in the, as we get ready in a little bit to move in. Sister Tina, you were talking about Nehemiah, you were reading, and so we're going to reference back to Nehemiah a little bit, and even though we read in those Old Testament books, and uh, we're reading of the rebuilding of the wall around Jerusalem, we're reading of what's happening here in, 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 uh, in Jesus' day and hour, there is great information that has already been predisposed. Uh, Free, uh, 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 dispense, I'll use that word, to us way back in the Old Testament to help us understand. So with all that said, let's get rolling. 
Verse number one, the Bible says, And there was a feast of the Jews. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Jumping down to verse number two, let's tie these two verses together. Now there is, is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five porches. Now Jesus is going to a feast that is at Jerusalem. Uh, once again, remember Jerusalem, the rebuilding of the wall. When we look at Nehemiah, that is where Jesus is. And so he is going to a feast. Now, there are three feasts in which every Jewish man was required to attend if he lived within a 15-mile radius of Jerusalem. That feast was either the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, or the Feast of Tabernacles. We will not go into that, but that was a time of celebration. That was a time of commemoration. That was very important to the Jews, even until this day, those feasts. And those three feasts were, were happening. One of those three feasts, we don't know what it is, but probably one of these three in which Jesus is coming to Jerusalem to attend. And uh, so the Bible says that Jesus arrives at the pool, the pool here, and uh, the word that is used in the original Hebrew is kuamba, uh, uh, and uh, or kuamba o, which means to die. How many of you think about summer and ever diving into the pool? Any of you ever dive into the pool, dive into the creek? I mean, even if you go up to the glen, I remember, I don't know, they still have, it used to be a swing in the, in the ice box, and you could swing and dive in there. But diving into, jumping into, getting into, just that, that word pool actually means dive. So when we look at the Bible being translated, we have great translators, and we trust God with those translations. But sometimes, looking back in the original text gives us a little bit of an understanding of, of a deeper meaning, particularly as we use our English language. So when we look at the word pool, it actually means a place that you can dive into. Can you imagine that when you, if you were sick, Brother Doug, and you wanted to be healed, particularly if this is a spring and it's bubbling and the angel of the Lord allows Brother Justin fresh spring water to bubble in there, and you want to be the first to dive in because you want to be healed. There isn't a, oh, I'm just going, yeah, my toes in a little bit, or way back, well, put my fingers in the water. No, there was a dive again. You wanted to be healed. And so uh, that, that word pool actually means dive. And uh, so when we look at the word pool, it was the pool of what? Bethesda. And so when we look at the word Bethesda, does anyone know what that means? Mercy. Mercy. So when we're looking at this whole context of what is happening here, when those who are lame, diseased, blind, uh, impotent, whatever it is, they can't function in life. Whenever they have the chance, they want to dive into the mercies of God. Amen. Is that any different than today when the Spirit of God begins to move in our services? And we know that when the presence of God is here, we feel the Spirit of God moving. Amen. It's time to dive into the mercies of God. Not just dabble our toes. Amen. Not just get a feel for what the water is like, but really dive in to the mercies of God and see what God has for us. And the Bible says, now when we get the idea of the pool, and then the, in the context it means die, Bethesda meaning mercy. And then we come on down and we read that it has five porches. Now porches are walkways or areas that are covered that are surrounding the pool. But when we, when we think about these porches, we think about particularly the number five. 
Now we're bringing everything together that God is telling us. We may initially read this and we may not gain it, but when we really understand it and, and look at it from a biblical viewpoint and digging in and getting all the gold nuggets and studying, we understand a place to die, die with God's mercy, and then there are five porches which when we look at the Word of God, oftentimes in the Word of God, number five is symbolic or indicative of grace. So diving into the mercies and the grace of God. We look at Benjamin, Joseph's little brother, and when he comes into Egypt, God, uh, Joseph gives him five portions. It's, it's grace. We look at Jesus when he had the five loaves and two fishes and he breaks the loaves and he multiplies them. What happens? It's the grace of God that over 5,000 are fed. We look at the number five. Five and multiples of five are used oftentimes throughout the tabernacle depicting the grace of God. And then think about this. How many, how many commandments did God give Moses? Ten. And if you look at the fifth commandment, the fifth commandment, and I'll tell you what it is in just a moment, if you don't know off the top of your head, it is the only commandment that has a promise attached to it. It says, children, obey your parents and the Lord. That what? That your days may be long. Uh, uh, that your days may be uh, 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 long uh, uh, upon the earth. Amen. So we have this attachment to it. So we look and we see three things as we're looking at, at verse number one and verse number two. We see that he comes to uh, this, 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 this pool and uh, uh, it is a place to die, a place where there is mercy, a place where there is grace. Now there's some other information that is attached to this. You may look and you may see the word market there as well. Now, understand, not all words that are given in our, our King James translation always line up with everything that we would understand and know today. So when we use the word market, a better word that we would use in our, in our vocabulary would be the word gate. Now I know that market and gate in our, our, our context of, of, of the words are vastly different. But research it, study it out for yourself. But the word is gate because it's set by the gate. And uh, particularly it was located on the northeast corner of the old city near the sheep gate. Now when we think about that, we think about sheep being led in and out, and it is a reminder that Jesus is the Lamb of God, who is the Lamb that was slain for us. Now, Sister Regina, it's easy for us when we read Nehemiah, not always to understand. But let's jump back to Nehemiah, and if you would, we're going to talk about the gates, the gates that are around the city, and what it may mean to us. So as you look at Nehemiah and he's rebuilding the walls, you're going to see that Nehemiah chapter number 3, he lists 10 gates that are in the city. Gates that can come in and out. Gates are doorways or entrances. And so we're seeing that this is the entrance into Jerusalem. This is where Jesus is coming in. He's coming in at the sheep gate. Uh, he, is, he, is, he is the Lamb of God, Brother John. If anyone has the authority to heal, if anyone has the authority to just to save, if anyone has the authority to pour out grace and mercy, it's Jesus Christ. And as he's coming in, they may not understand everything about Jesus Christ, but we know because we see the big picture of who Jesus is, the Lamb of God. But let's talk about the gates. So let's talk about the first gate. Someone read Nehemiah chapter number 3, verse 1 and 2. <coughs> Eliashib the high priest rose up with his brethren the priest, and they built the sheep gate. They sanctified it and set it over the doors of it, and even unto the tower of Mia, they sanctified it in the tower of Haniel. The next unto him goeth the men of Jericho, and next to them goeth Zephar, the son of Imar, Henry. So, now once again, we're looking at Jerusalem, 
This is where Jesus is coming to. We're looking at the walls being built. I am simply looking at the gates. That word market, verse number two, really, in our context of understanding, would be gate. By the sheep gate. That's where the pool is. Makes sense. They bring their sheep in. What would they do? They would drink at the pool, right? Where the water is, where the spring is. So there is a sheep gate. It is a reminder that the sheep gate is where the sheep will be led and they would be led into the temple of Jerusalem and there they would be taken for sacrifice. This is the starting point of Christ's work in our life. When we realize that Jesus Christ is the Lamb that was slain for the redemption of our sins, we understand this is where it all starts in entering into Christ. Let's read at the second gate. Someone read verse number 3 through 5. So there's one gate in, in, in Jerusalem. is the sheep gate. What's the next gate? Someone read verse number 3 through verse number 5. Maybe a little more than we need to read, but it gives us context. Don't let the big words scare you. But the fish gate is the son of Hesedah. Hesedah, though, who also laid the beams thereof, and set up the doors thereof, and lofts thereof, and bars thereof. The next unto them repaired Nermoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Kaz. And next unto them repaired Meshulam, the son of Baraka, the son of Nesher of Zebul. Next to them repaired Zadok, the son of Anna. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. And that, and as not on it, it's being on. And, then, and next unto them, the Nicolaites repaired, but their nobles put not their necks to the work of the world. So I'll be honest with you. Oftentimes, when I'm going to read some of these words that are challenging to me, so I'll read them, and then I bring up the Bible on audio, and I listen to how they're pronounced. And I write the pronunciations in my notes. However, I still get up here and slot the words, all right? So you all don't have that, that, that luxury of, of what I do, and I still mess, mess it up, all right? So I'm not worried about correct words. But this gate in Jerusalem, remember, it's just an entrance. It's just a door. There's 10 of these are on the wall of Jerusalem. It's just a reminder of the fish gate of our responsibility to be fishers of men. Then uh, we have, and I won't have you read it for, it's six verses here, but in verse number six through number 12 is the old gate. We need to remind ourselves that God is the God from the beginning, and God's message is, uh, it, 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 it is though it's old, it is not tarnished. It has been around for thousands of years, but it's still applicable. And all time has done to the Word of God is proven its authority. So remember that when we enter into the gates, the old gates, the gates of God's Word, we can know that we enter into the truth of God's Word. Not only was there the sheep gate, the fish gate, the old gate, but in verse number 13, there is that, that gate called the valley gate. The valley gate reminds us of our humility, and it speaks to us about needing to be willing servants of God and never resisting God. Because God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. So that's the gate that it reminds us of. And then, this is an interesting gate. Gate number 14. Would you like to guess what gate it is as you look? The dumb gate. Interesting word in itself, but it speaks to us about the place where garbage is carried out of the city. It's waste. It's, it's, it's the garbage. Each of us do that tonight's garbage out of our house. We carried some out, carry some more out when I get home. Amen. Get the garbage out. We want to get rid of it. But it's a reminder of, uh, to us that we need to cleanse ourselves. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 
In 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, the Bible says, For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but He has called us unto holiness. So there's a gate in the city that, that reminds us that, that we need to be clean. And then verse number 15 to verse number 25 tells us about the fountain gate. What is our fountain spiritually? It is the Holy Ghost that springs up in us. Amen. It gives us power to live a clean and a holy life. And then there is the water gate in verse number 26 and 27 where it's a reminder that God's Word is water and uh, that we might sanctify ourselves by the washing of the Word. And then in verse number 28, we see the horse gate. It speaks of welfare. It speaks of victory. Amen. Knowing that our victory is in Jesus Christ. And then in verse number 29, we read about the eastern gate. Where, where is Jesus going to come back? He's going to break the eastern sky. Amen. That's right. And so it is a reminder that the glory of the Lord is going to return. Amen. And then we read of the Mithcad uh, gate, which uh, speaks of the place of judgment. And Christ is going to come back and he is going to be a judge. Amen. That, that all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And so we look around the wall and there are ten gates. Jesus enters in through the sheep gate. And he enters into where the pool of Bethesda, the diving into mercy and grace is. Amen. Have you learned a little bit tonight? Amen. I find this to be very interesting to me. I find that all the knowledge that's given on God's Word, remember the Bible is built on this. The Bible is built on the law of first mention. We will read something in the Bible. It's mentioned the first time. We may not understand it all. It may not all be given to us. But we read something else again in the Bible. It's the second or the third, the fourth, the fifth time that it's mentioned. But we always refer back to the first mention and we build the context of our understanding upon every time it's mentioned in the Word of God. So when we read about the entering the market, the being the gate, he's entering through the sheep gate, it is a reminder to us there are ten gates in Jerusalem. And it's a reminder of what all of these gates represent and Jesus is entering in. Let's jump down to verse number 3. The Bible says, in, in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind, halt, wither, waiting for the moving of the water. So there's five porches, and in these porches where there are coverings and protection, there are a multitude of people that are laying. And this is a picture of what men and women look like without Jesus Christ. Jesus hasn't passed by. He is now passing by. We're getting an example of what it's like for one man to have a relationship with Jesus Christ and for him to be healed. But this, Brother Dennis, is a picture overall of what people look like, Brother Eli, without Jesus Christ. What do they look like? Well, well, they look like they're impotent, folks. What does that mean? They're just not able to perform. They're not able to measure up to the mercy and the grace of God. They're not able to measure up to God's standard. They're not able to engage in living. They are spiritually blinded. Uh, they are halt, which means that they are suspended from activity of really living. Before we know Jesus Christ, before we allow Jesus in our life, spiritually we are suspended of any type of spiritual living in Christ. And so then there are those that are withered. What does that mean? It means that they are dried up. They simply do not have. Without Jesus Christ, we are dried up. We just simply cannot be the production of life that God has intended for us to be. And then they're waiting for a move of the water. Amen. Spiritually blinded without Christ. Crippled. Oh, I want you to know sin leaves lives crippled. Whatever sin is, the addiction, the bondage, the lie, uh, the, the, the being bound by it, the not being able to be released, it leaves people halt. Remember that. When we look at folks who don't know Jesus Christ,
Christ. They're not engaged in living. They're simply suspended. But thank God that when Jesus comes, the suspension is over. The blindness is over. And the, 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 the crippleness is over. The Bible says in Proverbs 4.19, the way of the, of the wicked is as darkness. They know not what they stumble. People that are lost in sin, us before Christ. Darkness. So dark. Stumbling, you don't even know what they're stumbling over. That's what the Word of God says. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world, the Bible says, has blinded their eyes. Here are these people in all these porches, a place where there is grace, but they've never experienced Jesus Christ and the grace. They've never dived into the mercies of God. And there they are without Christ. Think about that. That's a powerful thought tonight. We read over this and what's happening. Every one of you are probably familiar with this story, but have we ever seen a, a, a picture of people without Christ? But Jesus shows up. It's a reminder that we cannot perform the work of God unless we walk with God. It's a reminder that our eyes are blinded unless Christ has opened them. It's a reminder that He is the one who can come in and help everyone. Amen. Uh, the remedy for sin and emptiness is Jesus Christ. The answer to all these people's problem is right in front of them. And it's Jesus. Now, I'm going to mention something on a textual nature note. And I'm going to let you run and you study and you, you discover it. And so when we read verse number 4, if you go back to the original text, and some text, it's not there. And so there can be a lot of controversy over verse number four, particularly with Bible scholars. And so, once again, I am going to let you look at that because the Greek manuscripts, um, uh, uh, some, are, are, some, some oftentimes this verse is not mentioned. And so... Uh, what I, what I can tell you, though, is when we read verse number 4, and we get back there, I still believe in the authority of God's Word. And there's much that we can gain, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to say a lot. The angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then was the first after the troubling of the water stepped in and was made of whatsoever disease he had. We know that however, however this happened, the angel is it spring bubbling up. Any of you ever seen a geyser? Any of you ever seen a spring of water bubbling up? Does the angel come over and that's how it happens? Um, you know, there's there's so much that we don't know from this passage of scripture. <clears throat> but but for me, there's no reason to dispute because all the other information is so strong that that is where we stand and we rely upon. Verse number 5, the Bible says, And there was a certain man there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. I want you to think about something. How old was Jesus that we feel like he was when he was crucified upon the cross? 33, 33 and a half years. Now wait a second. This is during the ministry of Christ. So it's somewhere between 30 to 33 years, right? Or a little over 33 years. How old was this man? How old was this man in Scripture? It's at the pool. 38. Right? So he, as older, and possibly and probably had this problem long before Christ ever was. Right? At least born. And so, uh, uh, Jesus wasn't intimidated by that. And Jesus saw everybody that was there. I mean, he looked and he saw everybody. But this scripture is a reminder of something. That no matter how old the problem is, Jesus is still the solution. 
even if it was there before we knew Jesus. Jesus knew us. And we may look and we may be in service and the Spirit of God is moving and the service may be directed in a way of healing, but we need an answer to prayer for something that's far different than healing. When Jesus walks into the room, He not only sees many needs, but He sees personal needs. He saw not many that were sick of many different diseases. We've already read it. I'm not going to go through them all. But there were many diseases. But He looked at this man, 38 years old, and the Word of God says that he had an infirmity for 38 years. <clears throat> So, however, old, huh? He could, have been he could have very well been older, Brother Eli, and I don't want to mislead us in Scripture. It know it meant when he had but we know that the disease was older than Jesus was. Yeah. So, if he's 65 or if he's 100, however, he had this disease longer than Jesus was. The Bible says in verse number six and seven, when Jesus <clears throat> saw him lie, and he knew that he had been now a long time and. and, and that case. He said unto him, Will thou be made whole? Jesus asked him if he wanted to get well. Did he say yes or no? No, he really didn't say yes or no. He just simply says this. I don't have anybody to go into the water. I can't get up. I can't get there. And I'm going to have someone to throw or dot me into mercy and grace when the water is troubled. Listen to me. Listen to me tonight. Listen to me. This describes our situation before salvation. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that any of us can do in here to get to the grace and the mercy of Christ. Because without Christ, we're helpless and hopeless. That's the truth, brother and sister. We're helpless without Christ. The Bible says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that is the good I find not. David said, The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and He helped me. Amen. There's nothing we can do for ourselves without Christ. The drug addict is the drug addict. The alcoholic is the alcoholic. The one who struggles with depression. The one who struggles with disease. The one who str struggles with their sin. They're, without Christ, there's nothing we can do. But then Jesus. But then Jesus. Amen. Praise God. But then Jesus shows up. <clears throat> the Bible says this. Listen, you may not have someone to pick you up and to take you to that pool, but let me tell you, the Word of God says that Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. Amen. Jesus said, You may not, but I have power over the sickness and the infirmity that you have for 38 years. You may live here and you may be seeing everyone else touch, but you feel like you have no one to help you. I am the only one who can help you. So rise, take up your bed. Jesus is here to help. No one else can give you the answers. No one else can deliver. No one else can breathe salvation. No one else can breathe hope. But Jesus is here. The Bible says, and immediately. The man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And the same day was the Sabbath. You know, it's amazing to me. Jesus speaks the word. Jesus touches. Our experience with Him, each one of us is different. But when the spoken word of God is given, it brings immediate results. Immediate results. 
Jesus never tells us. God never speaks to us. The Holy Ghost never speaks to us. And tells us something. That He will not give us the power to accomplish. Brother Justin, he told him, rise, take up your bed and walk. Not only did he tell us for God, but he empowered him for God to do what he had spoken. Remember this. It is important for us to have the Holy Ghost. But as many as received him, to them became the sons of God. He said this in Acts, uh, in Acts 1, verse number 8. The Bible says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Amen. We are filled with the Holy Ghost. He gives us power. When we are saved, He gives us power to walk in newness of life. Amen. Not only does He give us power to rise from the old death called suspended life, but He gives us power to walk. He said, rise, walk. I want to say uh, seven things. I'm going to close with this. Seven things He gives us power to walk in. He gives us power to walk and change life. Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, listen, even so, listen to me, even so, listen to the Word of God, we are to walk in newness of life. He gives us power to rise, but He gives us power to walk in newness of life. Language has changed. Attitude has changed. Hope has changed. Our whole life is rearranged. He gives us power to walk. He gives us faith. We don't walk by, by sight, but we walk by faith. He gives us power to walk spiritually. Walk in the Spirit that we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. He gives us power to walk in consistency. Amen. I therefore as a prisoner of the Lord, Paul said, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation where you are called. Paul says to walk in love and walk in love as Christ has loved us. We're to walk caution in caution. Remember what the Word of God says. See ye then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools. We're to walk Christ-like. He, uh, he that saith, uh, abide in me ought to also walk even as I walk. So we're going to walk differently. He said to the one who was sick and poor, I don't care how long you've been here. I don't care who you think you don't have. I'm an individual God. And I have the power to surprise. He got to the time of the grace and mercy because the great sheep, the great shepherd, came in the sheep. And provided for him something that was never provided before. I'm done. What do you think of that?